know, even if your ranch is 100,000 acres or even 200,000 acres, it's still right in the exact same climate system. You know, they're not allowed to, <laughs> to go for a thousand plus miles like they were in nature. So we have to physically move them, you know, by, with having fences to keep them in one paddock. Awesome. Well, good to see you guys again. How you guys been? Good. Good to see you, Doc. Yeah. So for for the folks that don't know, you guys are is, is our college South Dakota raising raising a bunch of bison. Is that is that still the case? I'm assuming it is. Yeah, we're still we're still <laughs> we're doing it. We haven't went broke yet. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's good to hear. I'm glad to hear that. I'll try to try our best to keep you guys in business. Hey, let me just for those that don't, aren't familiar with you guys, will you guys share your background real quick? Give us a give us a couple minutes on each each you guys so we know who we're talking to. Absolutely. Yep. I'm uh, Scott Osman. Um, we farm and ranch my family near Mission, South Dakota, on the south or South Central South Dakota, the Rosebud Sioux Indian Reservation. I'm fourth generation. My boys will be fifth generation. Um, I have a two-year-old and a six-month-old now. I think last time we talked, I just had a one one-year-old. So um, two boys. I uh, farm and ranch with my mom and my dad, Mike and Darla Osmond, and my wife, Caitlin. Um, we were always uh, raising beef cattle, black Angus beef cattle, and then we transitioned into, into bison in 2016, 2017. And then we've been farming organically since 1997. Um, and yeah, we, uh, partnered up with the Himes, Alex, his family in late 2019 to start Dakota Pure Bison, where we, uh, sell our ranch raised bison meat off both of our ranches directly to our, uh, directly to the consumer. We are also wholesaling now, but I'll let Alex give his background. Uh, Alex is very crucial in him and his family when we got into the bison business, uh, as far as advice and asking questions of what to do. So uh, that's kind of where the partnership started. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, Alex Heim, our ranch is located near Wood, South Dakota. We're about 70 miles straight south of Pier, which puts us just north of the Osmonds, about 15 miles. Now, the Himes got in the bison industry in 1967. My grandpa, Ignatius Heim, got the first animals. So we've had bison in our family for quite a few years. Um, uh, my wife, Cassie, and then I got three boys. Luke is seven. Kingston's just shy of three years old. And then we had a, we got a baby boy that's 10 months old, Blaze. So they're, they're part of our operation. We get a little bit of work out of them once in a while. I don't know how effective they are, but we're, <laughs> they're in training, you could say. So yeah, we've had bison in our family for quite a while. Um, it's the bison industry has went through a lot of ups and downs, you may say. They're, the peaks are pretty high and the valley has been pretty low. So it's been interesting to, to experience that. Um, luckily, most of that, the, the biggest valley, I personally didn't get hit on too bad. More of my, my father and some of my uncle and grandfather were. But is when it became a what I would say a very sustainable business is when people realized the quality of bison meat. You know, that is the end product um, that the consumers are, are striving for, and that's what we're producing. So um, we've been real excited to, to have the Osmonds. Um, we paired up with them and started to go to Pure Bison. It's been a, a pleasure being partners with them and then being able to ship our, our high quality bison meat throughout the country. Yes. 1967, that's the year I was born. So 55 years. So that's kind of a, kind of an interesting. <laughs> I got to, I just, this, I just thought of this, I don't know if it's, well, I, I'm sure you guys know the answer to this, but can you cross a bison with a domestic cow? Is that, is that, are they species? Are they, are they just, is that not going to happen? Is that something that can happen? Yeah. Or, you know? <laughs> I think it was in the 80s. There was some of that going on, the beefalo. You know, I know there's a little restaurant right in central South Dakota. I think the sign is still on it. It was a few years ago. It says, home of the beefalo burger. You know, it was in Miller, South Dakota, a little drive in there. But it, it never really caught on, you know. But, yes, it was, it was done. 
Yeah, it was daunted, but now it's very looked down upon. Uh, you know, it's just not not natural and it's not a good cross. Um, you know, now we're more and that's what a lot of questions we get is like, well, is that are your bison, you know, tainted with beef genetics and stuff? It's like, no, they're gone, you know. Um, and a lot of people test their animals for that, but then that test that they were doing, it it kind of wasn't legit anyways. The DNA <laughs> test. It's where there's been a lot of the DNA testing that people will go back and forth with is there's a few white bison that are bouncing around. And so people will say, oh, that's not actually a pure bison. And most of the time, it's it's a 99.8% bison. And somewhere in that lineage, they may find a gene that could have been a gene that tied back to the shark. Um, but and then also it depends on the some of those tests. They've done different tests where one time they say this test is accurate, and then 10 years later they'll contradict. Yeah. Yeah. So I just just a couple of things. I remember talking to you guys last time, I think it was, and there were some interesting things I just want to remind because people don't know this. So uh, the bison is actually a little bit smaller than, in, in many cases, some of the domestic cattle, if I'm not mistaken. And also, the hump that they have is not a hump of fat, but it's bone, right? Is that is that is that? Did I hear that right? Or am I remembering that correctly? Yes. Yep. So, yeah, the hump is actually just their extended vertebrae. Obviously, it has tendon and tissue connecting it. But you know, that was my. I didn't know anything about bison until we started looking into it. You know, there in early 2016. When the beef cattle prices begin to fall, and we were just tired of you know dealing with the labor of raising beef and the commodity market and things like that. But um, I just thought it was a big, you know, hump of fat, but it actually is. They're just vertebrae extend out, and they're not really sure 100 percent what the reason is for it, but whatever it was through evolution, um, they are they were designed for this area they're designed to run throughout uh you know the you know the midwest west western united states up into canada down into the northern side of mexico they are they are made for this area they're made to thrive here um so whatever reason it is it, it's working so yeah hey i've heard people say like with that even when they evolved to be able to to sweep through the snow to get down to vegetation if there was two, three, four foot of snow. That's no, that's, that's, yeah, like the beards too, they're big beards. They say that can be what the beards, because they have these big beards. And if they will, if you get towards springtime, those beards can be rubbed off and rubbing, you know, grazing through the snow, um, getting down to the forage. So that is most likely the reason. I also heard one reason was and that big strong neck and everything so they could bust through ice to get the water. I don't know if that's that's just one person's idea, but you know, they they eat snow. You know, you can there's some guys they won't even have water tanks in during the wintertime, you know, especially in northern Canada, where it's about possible to keep water thawed. They just eat snow all winter and they do great. You know, they're just they're survivors. It's uh, you know, they have three times as many hair follicles per square inch um as your standard beef cow does. Their uh, their trachea is about as big around as your wrist, or even a little bit bigger. Where beef animals about as big around as your thumb, um, and that is for surface area. So as they suck in extremely cold temperatures, there's more surface area to warm that air up to body temperature before it reaches their lungs, so it doesn't cool down their bloodstream. Um, they actually did a, one university did a test, and they could not get the bison to go into hypothermia. They couldn't get their cold chamber down cold enough. They took a yearling beef animal, a yearling bison animal. They took five yearling beef animals and one yearling bison animal. They couldn't get hypothermia to engage. So they really don't know how cold it has to be for a healthy animal to, to die. So it's, it's very, they're very interesting animals. They're very tough, they're very fast. Um, they're very dynamic, they're amazing. Yeah, I, I can tell you I was in Montana a couple of weeks ago and it was minus 20 and, and I'm not suited for that. I can tell you that I would, I would not, <laughs> that would be probably just chilling out there. Hey, let me ask you, 
what is the state? I mean, I know, you know, back late 1800s, you know, after we, we, sh we shot all the bison, you know, we got that number down into a few hundred. Where are we sitting today? I, I think I read somewhere about 400,000. What, what's the bison population like today? And what are you guys, what are you guys running up there? They've, they figure between four and 500,000. Um, it's hard to get an exact count where between these different nature conservancies and the reservations, um, you know, there's quite a few bison that do roam, you know, the prairies of the reservation communities. And some of those numbers are, are not known or tracked as um, precisely as maybe some of the private herds are. But to the best estimate, I'd say around 450,000. That's in the world. And is that number? That that's Canada, Most United States, Mexico, every that's the world, yeah. Okay, I, I guess I didn't realize there's a lot of bison, many bison in Mexico. But I mean, I understand their historical grazing area was pretty much all of that area, you know, in in years past. What you know, um, and and you contrast. I know in the U.S. we've got about ninety, I don't know, ninety three, ninety five million head of beef cattle, or, or you know, I think or beef and dairy combined, maybe something. Like that. I know dairy's around nine million, but what is it about bison? What are the advantages in your guys' mind? Well, why did you switch to bison over over cattle? I mean, beef cattle. I mean, what's what's what, what did you find the advantage to be? Our uh, I guess our reasoning for doing it was. You know, we already we were already kind of uh, there's several reasons, obviously, but one of the main reasons we were already kind of disconnected from the commodity market and the exchange by the, doing the organic farming, and which that has its up and down ups and downs. You know, just like Alex said, the peaks and valleys. Um, we kind of wanted to get disconnected from that as well. You know, from the beef market, because you can raise these animals, beef animals, go through all the work getting them, then you take them to town, and that day a report comes out from the USDA or a report comes out out of, you know, somebody from Chicago, the board goes down and you just don't make any money that day. So you really got tired of that. Um, and also just the labor involved. Um, obviously you, the, the initial costs were a lot higher for bison because you've got to have the correct facilities. You, we had to, you know, retrofit all of our fences, build new fences, that upfront cost and just the cost of the animals is higher at that time. But, once we do that, now it's me and about one other guy take care of all of our bison um, and, you know, pretty much handle everything. And before we had three or four full-time laborers, you know, for the calving and for feeding and, and for everything else, mainly calving and treating the animals, you know, beef animals are constantly sick where bison don't get sick very often, um, not really at all. And uh, it's just been a total difference, like lifestyle change. You know, this time of year, I would not be sitting here talking to you. I would be calving out beef animals because this is about in this area. This is when guys usually start calving their first calf heifers, beef heifers. Like all my friends right now, they're staying up all night, bringing all their animals into heated barns. And to me, I used to do that. It wasn't that long ago. You just you didn't really sleep much this time of year. Um, and now it's just like, I look at those guys, I feel bad. I used to feel bad. Now I'm just like, you guys are silly. You know, just there's a reason why bison calf in April and May. It's because the weather's nice and the calf might survive. You know, it's not naturally calf this time of year. That's just when we do it because that's what the market wants, um, beef, the beef market. So, yeah, it's, it's totally different for us. I mean, we, uh, it's a totally different, a lot higher quality lifestyle. The bison do have a mind of their own. And so you have got to have patience. You've got to practice good animal husbandry. And obviously with the rotational grazing and stuff we do, that that's helped us immensely keep those animals moving on a fresh, fresh pasture. But uh, yeah, I don't know what to do. You know, you know the, I've had bison and, and beef around our family most of our lives. And, uh, you know, they're an amazing animal. They're a very majestic animal. So... So that's great, you know, people like that. But things also, part of sustainable has to be economical and it has to factually, economically work. And I stated earlier, you know, with a, a niche market, there can be a higher peak and a lower value. But traditionally that is very connected to supply and demand. I mean, a very direct supply and demand. So many traded commodities, you know, it, it, it is looked at as a supply and demand, but there's so much, in my mind, 
fictitious stuff that's going on that can alter, you know, something happens, you know, why, why does this market go up? We'll use corn. Why does corn go up 70 cents in the overnight trade opens at 50 over by the end of the day, it's 30 down. Like did something actually happen? We have none of that in the bison. I mean, it's the bison industry is a very level playing field. Of, when something happens, it truly happened. It wasn't, it wasn't based on something that's not a local factual. So I like that. You know, you can be in the know and truly understand what is going on, why it's going on. Yeah, and just having that control, quality control, you know, we can we can take our animals that we know are the best, you know, that we've raised and the genetics are the best. And that's where your price is based off of the quality. And, and you can take animals that you know exactly where they were raised at, and how they were raised. And we can take those and send them directly to our customers where there's just no BS, you know, there's no middleman and, and everything else like that. Um, and that's where the bison really have the advantage and just for us raising you can obviously be at the beef world as well but you're just disconnecting yourself like what alex said there's no graph that's going like this that affects your entire livelihood so it's kind of more up to you of if you want to do a good job and and portray yourself and get your message out there you have that ability to and you have the right to do that you mentioned genetics and, you know, one of the things, you know, within the beef cattle industry is, you know, there's, there's a lot of premium placed on, you know, crossing their animals and looking for these particular characteristics, how much marbling they lay down, uh, you know, uh, how easy they are to deal with temperament, so on and so forth, you know, successful calving and all that type of thing. Is there much of that going on in the bison world? I mean, are there different little breed, interbreed, I know there's major breeds of animal, but I mean, are there like temperament things or how do you guys deal with that? Or is that just, Bison or bison, you let them let them do what they do. There's there's some of that. It's on a much slower rate uh, because we don't use artificial insemination. We don't use embryos. Um, we try to remain everything in a very natural state. So it's it's on a playing field that's much more gradual. Or in the beef industry, between you know AI and embryo work, I mean you can take and create genetics. Fast, fast and lots of them in a hurry for the bison industry it's all done naturally so there is there is natural selection and quality work being done but it takes years if not decades plus to do it compared to in two years you can have things you change, change the industry yeah Correct. like a you know beef animal i could take if i had a thousand heifers red heifers that were heifers that i bought I could breed them all to the hottest bull in the industry, like in the Black Angus world. And then you just have a bunch of copies of that bull that everybody wants in you next year. You say, hey, I got them They're here. Or in the bison world, I mean, if you get a bull, the biggest record I've heard of by DNA testing is, you know, one bull breeding like, what, 68 cows. Um, and then of that, you know, half of them are going to be, you know, bulls and heifers. And you don't, you still don't know if he's going to produce you know, there's a lot of awesome bulls out there that just throw average calves. Um, so you don't, there's just, it's more natural. Like I was like, I have bulls that I bought at these show and sales, the highest quality, what I thought was the highest quality animals. And obviously what the market thought was the highest quality animals because they were very expensive. Now this just happened yesterday. Uh, I had three bulls all fighting each other. They're all like six, seven years old, which is, for buffalo bulls, that's old, mature. They're all under the dominant male. I had three of them all fighting each other. They all cost anywhere from $12,000 to $20,000. And all three of them were just fighting and trying to kill each other. <laughs> so it's just like, that's nature. Just like, oh yeah, here's a, I have this expensive bull. I might just go kill that other expensive bull. You know, so that's a cool, that is cool and uncool financially. But um, so you do want to, we focus on genetics. That's one thing we do. So like I have, like private sale, like Alex came to my place yesterday and he picked out bulls that he wanted to buy. We just had them priced, but he picked out the traits, traits that he liked, you know, whether it's uh, you're looking for an animal that's more meaty, might not be as big or an animal that you want to put some more stretch and size on your whole herd, just, you know, structure, how structurally sound they are. But we genetics is something we focus on. And then like for meat production, it's, 
it's all about genetics, really. I mean, you can either have an animal, a high quality animal that, you know, breeds a, a that'll produce a high quality female animal and they might be ready for market a year sooner than a low quality animal. So it's very important to the high quality, low quality, just like beef is. Um, but it's just like, it's just like Alex said, it, it's just so much to the smaller, slower scale because the heifers don't have a calf till they're three years old. Well, then you have that calf isn't going to breed anything till he's two. You know, it's just such a longer term thing. But we we both try to focus on the high quality genetics because it's just going to get better and better every year your herd is. You know, selective breeding, what does well in your area, something that does well in our area won't do well in southern Oklahoma, you know, or or Texas or whatever. So you might want to pick for that more modern animal the further south you go where the animals don't get as big because they don't have to fight as much snow and guys in, in canada they're going to want a bigger frame of your animal because they're going to be grazing through four foot of snow you know it's just whatever you're into yeah interesting let me let me ask you i mean you know because when i see uh uh and i guess i don't know i guess i should know this but i mean buffalo i mean i don't see horns on them i know the cattle they dehorn them I, I, do 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 the, the bison grow horns? I don't even know. I just I can't remember seeing our small ones. Maybe. And do you no, deal they with do. Those and bison, just... bison all have horns. Males and females both. Um, the males have bigger horns, but they both have horns. They're born without them. They don't. Right. Yeah, well, that would be uncomfortable for the female to deliver an animal with horns. I would imagine. Yeah. So I mean, you know. <laughs> but I, you don't see the big like the longhorn cattle with the giant horns. You, they don't grow like the giants because you know you guys don't mess with the horns, do you? I mean, you leave them alone, I suppose, right? Leave them. Yeah, they. It's part of their identity. Those horns. Um, they. Uh, you know, a, an old boss cow with big old horns. She's gonna be first the water tank versus a smaller cow with uh, smaller horns. So it's very. It's part of their identity. They're they're their weapons. It's it's what they use to to figure out the pecking order of the entire herd. You know, it's 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 very important. Yeah, one other thing I hear about, you know, you know, obviously AI is very very big in, in both the beef and cat in the in the dairy industry. And one of the things they say is because you know these animals when they mate naturally, there's a lot of injuries. You know, there's bullying injuries. Is that a, is that a feature of bison? Do you have to worry about the bulls? breaking the dang, you know, uh, heifer's back, or how does that work? No, as a rule, that's on the female side. You know, you can have some bulls. It's less common in bison than I would say in beef. You can have them get hurt. More of their back legs would be probably a thing that would be most commonly hurt. You know, if they're trying to, uh, to breed a female and another bull comes up from the side and hits their back end, and they're having all that weight back on their back feet, that can be can be very hard on them. What about, you, you mentioned you, you're doing a regenerative style. What are the, one of the th things that drives the, the thought process behind, you know, the, the guys that do regenerative beef, beef uh, cattle is they, they, they pattern it off the, after bison and other herd animals that say, you know, these guys naturally would graze and move on and predation would cause them to move on. Do they do that naturally or do you still have to direct them a little bit? And how do you do, do you, is it by fencing? I know there's some, I mean, some people are using collars now with, with, with you know, kind of uh, electric fences that are kind of, you know, they're basically shock collars to kind of keep them in a certain area. How do you guys do that with the bison? We, we do that all by fences and rotating them through. I do know there's a, a very large individual that has a lot of bison in the private sector. And there was a time where they thought if they had a big enough ranch that the bison would hopefully do that on their own. And the problem is, is they, they will to some extent, but it's awful hard to get that big to truly allow them to naturally, you know, even if your ranch is 100,000 acres or even 200,000 acres, it's still right in the exact same climate system. You know, they're not allowed to, <laughs> to go for a thousand plus miles like they were in nature. So we have to physically move them you know, by with having fences to keep them in one paddock or pasture compared to another. Yeah, that's just like Alex said. You you can't you you know they just they're they're herd animals and they move. You know they move to stay ahead of the parasites and they stay keep on fresh grass. But just like 
he brought that up. You know, you think you can just take out all the fences and just let them go. Well, they'll come back, they'll graze off an area, and then there's just they they'll make their whole loop and well, you got this huge ranch. Well, they're back there in five days when that little fresh regrowth is coming that needs to be left alone. They'll nip that off again. And it's not good for the land. So yeah, that's what we do. So you know, I just am doing a fencing project right now where I had uh, about 2,200 acres that was only in four pastures. And we cross fenced it and we turned it into eight pastures and add water tanks. And so, the, you know, just improved it overall. So now instead of spending a month in a pasture where they might graze off an area and then that'll regrow, you know, after a rain and they come and graze off again, that hurts that plant root. You know, the plant wants to be grazed and left alone because that's how it would have been when bison were roaming. They would have grazed an area off. And then in two weeks when that regrow, well, they're, you know, 500 miles away by then. And anyways, so we'll go and move them through. Our, in this area, our rotation, we try to give anywhere from 80 to 90 days rest period. Longer is even better, 100. But like we'll go through and we'll spend, you know, in a half section of ground, we'll spend a week or two, depending on the herd size. And then move to the next one, we won't come back there for 90 days. So we'll generally go through everything, uh, you know, one and a half to two times a year and then get them off there and, and uh, keep them off for the winter. You, we can winter graze, but we're not set up for that because we do run on range units, at least from the reservation. And you can only have them on there so many days. So we choose to keep those animals on the grazing days during the prime grazing periods when the grass is green and, and uh, not going there. Um, so we'll move them off to other land of ours that we need for winter grazing. Then we do end up feeding, you know, January, February, March, we do, uh, we do end up feeding our animals. Eventually we'll get, as we fence more ground, get more winter grazing places. Eventually I won't, I'm not planning on having to feed hay, but for, that's what works for us right now. We have the hay because we do sell hay. Now that we don't have beef animals, uh, as many beef animals, the bison don't eat here as much. We actually have access of hay that we can sell to other producers. So, yeah, I was going to ask you about the winter stuff because you know, like like I said, when you assume you get off the hay, how do you? I mean, you know, if everything's covered in snow, how the hell do you know if there's anything to forage underneath it? I mean, is it something you just kind of assume it's there? Is there a way to figure that out? Do you dig down through the snow and say, "Hey, there's grass under here, and let's move these guys into this paddock," or how does that work? More by the ranch management plan. You know, you know, if we we're to, when we pull animals, move them into a pasture that was specifically set up for dormant grazing, and then we know by the the volume of, of forage there, it should last them x amount of days. You know, twenty days, thirty days, fifty days, um, by how many acres that will traditionally carry. What's the difference in like, you know, like traditionally we, I guess it depends on obviously where in the world you're at, but I mean, if you were, if you, if you put 50 head of bison in a field that you guys have compared to 50 beef cattle, are they going to eat more? Are they going to eat less? Are they going to spend more time or less time on that pasture? What is it? Is it cheap? Uh, they'll eat less. Cheaper. Yeah, they'll eat less. Two things, like you first stated, they are smaller from a weight stance. So that naturally, an animal is going to end up eating around two and a half percent dry matter of their body weight. Well, if an average bison cow weighs 10 and a half to 11, your average beef cow probably weighs 14 and a half. You know, right there, you can gain about an extra 20 percent less they'll eat because of just that weight. And then you'll really notice, especially it seems like in the winter months, a bison's metabolism slows down. So then they'll even eat that much less. Where a beef animal, they eat that much more because it's cold. They're trying to keep body weight on. Yeah. Yeah. But just like Alex said, we really notice that they will, if they kind of go into dormancy as well, the metabolism slows down. They just don't require as much because that's naturally what they had to do through the winter grazing months is they had to slow down that metabolism. And it's actually believed that they create their own urea somewhat in the, uh, through the human process, they can create some of their own protein um, when needed. Their body can use those stores uh, in certain ways. I, I don't know if that's true. I heard that. I know it was a study done, but that's 
They, uh, they, they're survivors. What's the difference, you know, in, in, in the meat quality between or meat, the differences in, in the meat, you know, I mean, obviously, I mean, most people have always, you know, traditionally going back since the 80s, I heard bison meat's a little bit leaner and therefore it's healthier for you. What can we say about bison meat? I, you know, I mean, yes, it's probably leaner, but are there other like different factors we find in bison yep. meat versus beef? Beef. Yep. So bison, uh, they are leaner, um, leaner, less fat um, than beef. It is, you know, it could be, there's, they're doing some more studies, but as far as like micronutrient dense, it could be some of the most micro micronutrient dense foods on the earth, you know, as far as red meat goes. I think there's maybe some fish, something they think might be higher in micronutrients, but bison could have some of the highest, especially get into the organ meats and things like that. Um, overall, you take a young prime animal, um, and if you feed it to someone who thinks they're getting a, they might be thinking they're getting maybe some lean beef or something like that. Some of the time they can't tell the difference unless they really know, but it's not like an elk or a deer. It is not like a game meat, obviously, unless you get an old, old animal that's, you know, just very old, they get very lean. But where we just use our young prime animals, um, that that's that's the difference and one of the biggest differences you know it's more protein uh less fat than beef and higher micronutrients i think is probably one of the biggest outliers because it is a uh, it is a wild you know a wild game type but it's not as people are expecting elk when they get it and they eat it and they're like whoa this is you know some it's its own thing it's something totally different so but it's definitely more similar to beef especially we see in the burger so we do our 90 percent lean burger and you can eat 90% lean beef burger, and it's not even the same thing. There's something about the fat content that is much cleaner. You get done eating it, you feel good. You don't have that weight to you, um, and you don't have that film that gets in the outside of your mouth. There's something about the fat that is a lot more natural, and it leaves you with a lot cleaner feel when you're done eating. You never get done eating a, a bison steak or a bison burger, and you're just like, oh, man, what did I just do? There's none of that. And that's the burger is honestly probably one of the things that sticks out to our customers over beef more than anything because they can put it into whatever food dish they're using, and there's the, not the grease, the the splatter, and the the smell that you get from that beef fat. So, like I just grabbed one of a a nutritional, you know, what you guy can find online. Yeah. But like compared to a a beef, you know, in grams of fat beef is four to five times higher you know in another per serving yeah. per serving all on i don't know if you guys can see, see that exactly or not but it's um something that a guy can it's online as well yeah online i don't know if that was clear but there's different tables that people when they see that they're very amazed you know from the low how low it is in fat and how low it is in calories Higher, higher in iron, higher in you know your vitamin B twelve. Um, so it's it all. It also uh, bison is for whatever reason bison is non allergenic. We have a few different people that can't eat red meat, but can eat bison meat, and they're hundred percent fine. I think that in itself is there's something about that is very amazing. It's very amazing. Like, and that's legit. We, you know, was it a cousin of yours? No, no, yeah, no. A couple really, different yeah. people that I, I don't even know, them, but there's acquaintances that that you go get. And I think it was, there was a college that, had, I don't know if it's Pennsylvania. One of the colleges did do a research project on it and they can explain it more, but I, I don't have the information. Yeah, one of, one of the things, you know, when you, pull up the, when you pull up the nutritional comparison between uh, bison and beef, and I think there are a few others in there I couldn't catch, yeah, I wasn't paying attention to them, but the, the cholesterol numbers are pretty much similar. And it's kind of interesting because most people would associate a higher fat animal with higher cholesterol, but the cholesterol is actually in the muscle itself. I think it's in the cell membranes. And so you have a more cellular, you know, more dense cellular product with that. I was, I was, I was interested to find that ribeye had less cholesterol than sirloin, which surprised me. I didn't, I, you know, I've been doing this for so many years. And I just learned that out, you know, a few months ago. So I thought that was interesting. And, I, and cholesterol has now been deemed not a, not a nutrient of concern 
they, you know, cholesterol has been undemonized, whereas saturated fat, you still people see people complaining about that. And that's kind of one of those things that's in my mind debatable, at least. Let me ask you about, um, well, somebody asked about the, the cost comparison. I think, they, I think in what I've seen, you know, if I go to the store and I see ground bison versus ground beef, they're pretty similar in price. They're not a big, huge difference, but are you finding, because are you guys, you guys are mostly direct to consumer, is that correct? We're growing in the wholesale market as well. Um, you know, that takes another, kind of another level to be able to do that. So Dakota Beer Bison is really trying to do that direct to consumer, but we're also growing that wholesale account as well. And the price right now, you are, are very accurate. I mean, there's times where we'll find beef being higher than bison. And I think we'll probably, you probably will see bison, maybe it'll just maintain that even threshold, but as a rule, bison, and it should cost more. It should cost, it should cost more because of some of the, the market trends that are going on with beef. It's caught up to the bison price and the bison price is maintaining that, that threshold at the moment, but um, it will be going up. The price, our prices across the board, no matter what you're talking about, are going up. So we have to go up as well. But because we are not such a traded commodity, we're trying to hold that threshold as tight as we can. Yeah, we're, you know, that's, that is surprising. We'll get pictures of that of beef and, and bison in the grocery store, and especially in the big box stores. It's, for me, it's tough to believe because, um, you know, bison is so much more limited than beef. It's just not a trade commodity, but marketers, they can, they can do things and manipulate the market and the beef industry. But like for us, we just get, I'm getting calls constantly, like the boxes that we ship our product out in, they went up 10% then they go up 4%. Then FedEx calls and say, hey, our shipping price is going to go up 10%, 4%. So we will have to come up. We're trying to keep it as close as we can. Um, but, you know, our labor's going up, uh, Everything's going up for us. So we do need to, we will have to up our prices some, but it is wild to see beef catching up with bison. So, yeah, I mean, the, the fuel price, you know, the fuel prices alone going up are just to impact just about every single industry out there. And then we, you know, and, and, and you guys probably don't deal much with fertilizer. Maybe you do, but I know the fertilizer price is going up significantly and, you know, everything's going up. And so you can't expect it not to affect the food. When you look at the inflation rates, I think I saw that. They're claiming 7.9%, but you know, if you look at some of the things, in fact, I think beef prices are up something like, I think 25% or something like that, which is, which is enormous. What about, um, so you, you talk about some of the market factors that affect beef and obviously fuel is fuel and you, you guys gotta, um, you gotta use fuel somehow in transporting and shipping and all that stuff costs. But as far as, you know, one of the, one of the concerns I hear from a lot of, you know, beef cattle producers is, you know, they're, they're getting kind of the short end of the stick when it comes to, you know, the, the, the prices they're giving, you know, the, the, the packing industry just kind of, like you said, it fluctuates wildly. Are you guys relatively insulated from that? Is that something that you, I guess you guys kind of alluded to that, but is that, does that affect you guys at all? Is there anything that affects you with that? Or is it just kind of other things that do maybe the weather, I guess, obviously weather is always going to be an impact on, you know, ranching and farming, I suppose. <laughs> Across the board, you know, everything is just affecting you. You know, I mean, like you said, from just when fuel goes up, right? It affects everything. Everything, you know, um, I know. To get the box, to get the foam, to get the employee, to get you know the hat, the T-shirt, the um, the wire, the post. Uh, that is know. a big thing. Uh, I just <laughs> bought some more posts to fence some more ground for the bison so we can graze more. And they were what, 590? Yeah, five, five, five and a half. 550 per post, $5.50 per post. And now they're seven dollars and five cents a post. Yeah, it's 27%. It's 27 percent. And that was that's been a year and a half. Um so it's just been brutal that way. Um you kick yourself for not buying more back then, but you can't just have all your money tied up. It's something that you're not ready to put in yet, you know, for land that you might have access to. So that's just something you got to deal with, but it's got to, it, it does affect everything. I mean, just that little, just that one little thing, it changes your bottom line on, on all the way to that end, to the end producer. It does. So um, 
uh, the thing that we can't insulate ourselves from is from just having to take that price from the beef packer. Um, those guys just decide what it's going to be, and the beef guys have no option. Um, obviously, we work with processor. We have a great relationship with our processor. Um, so we do have some insulation there, but he's got the same issues we do. He's got to pay his help more. He's got to pay more for boxes. He's got to pay more for um, packaging materials, everything. So that cost will come on to us, but it's just, we know we're going to have a spot to go with our animals. For us, it's very worth it. It's always going to be a high quality product. Our processor, he is, uh, does an amazing job with our animals. And, uh, you know, he knows more than we'll ever know. He's forgotten more than we'll ever know. So he he takes care of us that way. Um, but he's got to make money as well. He's got to, you know, feed his workers. He's got to, you know, feed his family. So one of the hardest things yeah, is the price. If the price goes up, at least we can do something. You know, if you got to bump the price 10 cents a pound, you you bump it. But if you can't get it, that's hard. Like the label, you know, have a label on a stick or a steak or whatever. Then all of a sudden you can usually get them in six to eight weeks and then they tell you six months. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a real problem. Yeah. I was going to wonder, you know, a lot of, a lot of things I hear about, like, you know, a lot of the beef producers, you know, they get their cattle fat at a certain age and, and then, you know, if, if the prices are low, they're kind of compelled to sell because if they keep them all in the, in the lot, in the feed lot, they got to keep paying to feed them and it gets expensive, particularly as feed prices keep going up and up, it seems like. So you guys are on grass for the most part, unless, you know, I guess you have a little hay in the, in the winter season, but do you have a little bit more like leeway? Like, I mean, I, well, I guess it doesn't, I mean, the price isn't fixed by Tyson or anything like that, but I mean, I guess you would have the, I mean, is there like a critical time once they hit this weight at this age, we got to, we got to bring the slaughter. Do you have a few months to just kind of, I can wait until something else has happened? Well, no, you want to, you want to, you know, every day you have that animal around, you have costs um, big time. It is because it's just, you only have, you can only have them around for so long as your costs just get too much. Every day you have that animal, you have a responsibility to keep it alive. Um, there's all the costs associated. So when that animal hits prime weight, and also it's just time, the more time that animal is on your place is the lower quality its meat is getting. So we have got to, I mean, it's not like we need to have it gone this week, not next week, but you can't keep that thing around for an extra 60 days. Otherwise your profit could just be gone, you know? Um, and, and then the quality goes down as well. The quality of the, the meat, um, you know, people talk about aging a steak or aging, whatever you can do that. That's fine. But the biggest factor in that is the age of the animal for our end consumers. And, and you'll see that you have an animal that isn't as high quality genetics. So it wasn't ready for market until six months later. You can tell when you cut into that steak. Um, so that's why another reason to focus on the high quality genetics, the faster growing animals, it, it matters. Do you guys, um, I know like, you know, most beef producers, you know, they're using the USDA uh, slaughterhouses. Not all of them do. There's some that use local and they sell within state and stuff like that and sell about a quarter and a half and stuff like that. Are you guys beholden to have to use the USDA facilities? And do the beef slaughterhouses process the, the, the bison slaughter? Are they are they interchangeable? Because I know some are just set up for a certain weight, and they you know if, they, if the cow's too big, they can't process them. They got to go to a special processor in Wisconsin or something like that. If they have these super big cows, how do you guys interact with the processors? I thought that was Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's bigger in Texas. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I, I heard that. I heard there's like Wisconsin had some super big for big super animals like you know fifteen hundred you know pound cows. Oh yeah, something. you're. Yeah. You're a hundred percent right. That's what everyone's, everyone's everything's bigger in Texas except for the animals. All the animals are smaller in Texas because it's so hot down there and they have no snow to graze through. So it's like, why would I be a big old hairy beast when it's 110 degrees all the time? So like we go down there and their deer down there look like our golden retrievers out here, you know. Their deer are so small just because there's no reason to be big, you know, you don't have no snow to fight through or anything. So we but, do yeah, the plants can be interchangeable. Um, bison are a non-amenable species. So when they go through a USDA inspected facility, that facility 
has to pay that USDA inspector to be there for that time. The time that they're doing bison, those inspectors are paid privately, where with B, those inspectors are paid by the, the federal taxpayer. So that's one, one thing that is different about that. Um, if you're at a USDA facility, you will have to pay that additional. It's usually around, it can vary from $30 to $60 a head, depending on the scale of the plant. And, and, and for instance, um, like if I get buffalo from South Dakota, obviously it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's interstate for me because I'm out here now in Washington State. Does that require USDA uh, facility to, to transfer that with bison or can you ship interstate without USDA now? Yeah, we, we can do it with just state inspection because of that um, non-amenable species. So like if it was killed at a, a state inspected facility, which the state, the state facilities are supposed to be equal to or greater than federal, but there's still some limitations. But with the non-amenable species, we can um, ship that anywhere in the United States because it's non-amenable species under state inspection only. It doesn't have to be federal. Most of our animals are processed um, at a USDA inspective facility. Just like Alex said, it doesn't have to be what you use. Uh, it's it it helps you know it's it's good it's good that it's that way it's ridiculous that beef is that way I mean it's just it's ridiculous that, that you know I mean whatever you want to have the high standards but a state inspected animal you know if I'm if I want to sell it to my neighbor that's thirty miles away in Nebraska that's illegal um so that's just bizarre I know Wyoming I, I don't know if that actually got passed or not COVID during COVID they were working on some of that stuff because of the shortage of meat trying to allow some of this transferring. And I don't know how that all shook out. Yeah, I know there's a law, I can't remember the name of the law that got passed in Wyoming, but I think it did allow for what you guys mentioned. And uh, I can't remember, I think the, it's kind of funny. I mean, I think there was something, some kind of funny business going on that the guy that actually sponsored the bill in Wyoming uh, was defeated in reelection because some people from the beef industry didn't like it. <laughs> they paid for this, his opponent because they, they, they like the status quo. They like, you know, the Packers controlling the beef market. They don't like the, they don't like the uh, challenge to that, I suppose. I mean, that's what I heard. I don't know how much truth is, is in that, but I suspect it might be. Um, what, you know, as far as, um, well, your, your, your business, are you guys growing in herd size and stuff like that? Is that, is that something you guys have been actively trying to do? Do you have the land to do that? What is a, what does the long-term look like for Dakota Pure Bison? Are you guys doubling your herd size over the next 10 years or what, what's the, what's the plan for you guys? Yeah, we're trying to grow, you know, lamb is land is a very limiting factor. So with that land base, you can only run so many animal units. Um, and real estate prices continue to, to go up. So we are, I mean, I think we're two separate operations, but both of us are always looking to grow and, and have had some growth, whether it's purchased land or rented land. Um, so we are growing um, in some volume, in some capacity. So hopefully we can also continue to grow our meat sales as well. Are you guys are you guys like maxed out on the number of cat uh, number of cat number of bison head you can put on the what you, what you have on acreage wise right now? Is that pretty much yeah, right so now? Yeah, get... I'm I am maxed out. And I actually am in down a few animals this year just because of the drought over the last couple of years. I didn't want to push push my grass. So I didn't add that many replacement heifers this year as a uh, uh, as you normally would, just so that you know we we can manage that through that better. Um, last thing you want to do is, oh yeah, I'm sure it'll rain this year. It didn't rain the last two. You, that's not the not the risk we're willing to take. So I'm actually down about 25 bred cows this year from the ones last year. I think I'm running about 840. And last year I think it was a little over 865 bred cows on my place. Um, and then also we'll have some yearlings running uh, on a satellite, satellite operation. But 
Um, yeah, we're I, constantly looking to grow. Um, for us, especially with organic farming, we're looking. I'm, you know, the biggest restriction is just the cost of fence and development of water, but grazing more of our farmed acres as well. That's something I'm going to grow on this year more and years continued so I can graze all of our, you know, farmed acres, graze cover crop, graze, graze crop residue. That's something we did with beef cattle, but, you know, you can't just go string up a one wire fence and run your buffalo out there like we could with our beef. So that's been a, a limiting factor for us. You got to have a good fence. You got to be a good neighbor. Um, that is one of the issues with the bison industry is everyone wants to have some bison. Well, they, they buy them, they drop them off their place and they, they can't handle them. They can't manage them because they don't have the, enough fence bill. Um, so that is got to have the land base, got to be continuous land and got to have good fence, good facilities, good corrals. So. so you have to put up basically essentially permanent, permanent fencing for each pasture and, and, and you know, not just a one one wire electric fence. It was bust through that pretty much. Is that fair to say? Yeah, you can you can get by with some stuff, like especially just on your cross fences, um, for cutting it up so they can graze tighter areas. There's people that do do that, do the one wire band, you know, like a uh, a rope or whatever, and it will work ninety five percent of the time. Um, you know, but for a for a border fence, it's got to work hundred percent. So we just do, you know, just barbed wire. Um, I've even done some barbed wire with a hot wire offset. I don't know how Alex has done some of that. Uh, you know, just give them a little buzz when they get close to it. Then if you get them trained right, that's fine. But then bison are so ornery and they're so, you know, they're so hurt. You know, they have such a social dynamic that if two bulls get alongside the fence, one bull might try to push the other bull through the fence just to prove a point to them that I'm tougher than you. So that's when everything kind of goes out the window. Then your your awesome little hot wire that you can use to, you know, it's just gone, you know. So that's where you got to have a fence that is a barrier for them. Um, and the wildlife can still go. That's the question we get. It's like, oh, your deer can't get out. It's like, no, the deer jump right over that. That's no problem, you know. And then the antelope, they can go underneath it. We put the hot bottom wire high enough the antelope can go underneath it and the deer can jump over the top you know it's only about a five foot fence so it's the uh, one one thing that's also very different with bison from a beef is if they do get out they just you know a, a nice steady pace and they just go you know usually if a beef animal was to get out because there's beef cows out all the time yeah you know? beef cows are out especially in this country they're just out you know they're People just, you know, because you can just go get them back in. That's it. They, they, yeah, they'll just stay right in the ditch. You know, if a bison does get out, you might find him two miles away. And if, if it's very long, he might be four or five. You know, they don't just hang out in the ditch. They just, you know, they, they'll roam. Um, yeah, and you really have like, right. do, do they have any like GPS tracking technology for animals? Can you, I mean, I guess you put a collar on or something. I don't know how. We have a. Uh, we have a beef neighbor I know located by Winter, South Dakota, that has been messing with that or experimenting, I should say. They're experimenting with those collars that go on them. Um, I think they had all right luck. I heard about one. We had a deal after church at a supper one evening, and we were visiting with them about, I think last summer was, was the first year they were utilizing that. And so I don't know how that's coming, but I, I don't think that'll yeah, be yeah, for utilizing the bison industry. I had, I had a friend who's a rancher in, in, in California, I went to visit him, and he was doing the collars on his cattle. And he said, you know, it works about 95% of the time, but there's some animals that just don't respond and they just ignore it. And so you still got to deal with those couple of yeah. kind, you know, kind of players. And let me ask you about um, a lot of people within the regenerative beef, you know, space, do a lot of multi-species grazing. You know, they'll, they'll run cattle in behind it. They'll pull chickens through, and then they might throw some sheep or something. Do, 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 do buffalo or bison rather play nice with other species, or are they, is it not a good idea to do something like that? Yeah, yeah. There's people that um, I know a gentleman that ran beef and bison together both. Um, I actually had some goats. I still have a few goats, but if you think a bison is hard to keep in, try to keep a goat in. Oh, <laughs> uh, because uh, I was going to play with that a little bit with the goats, and 
you know, on a small scale, scale compared to the the bison to see if because they'll graze very much a different um, vegetation than a bison, more of a browser. But we still have about 50 for my kids project, but we kind of aborted the mission of, of having them run with, kind of run where the bison would maybe run. Um, you could probably do it, but you're gonna have to make sure you have some fencing. You should put woven wire at the bottom and then have your couple barbs and then it'd probably go plum gray. Yeah, it's just managed okay. uh, kind of what you want to manage through. Um, for us, that's bison is our focus. Um, that's what we do. We have looked into, you know, um, back when we raised beef, we actually looked pretty seriously into merino, merino sheep, uh, running them behind. Um, but it's just, we, we let, we think, you know, bison is kind of what naturally roamed here. So that's what, that's what we're sticking with. And that's, that's as much management as, as we really want to do. It's like Alex talking about with the goats. It's a different management style. It's got to be someone, someone's project, someone's work to do that. And I think that's awesome when guys do that. That's that's pretty cool. We like get in, graze it off, get everything off there for 90 to 100 days, to let that land recover and regrow. You know, here in our area, we, are, we have warm season and cool season grasses, um, tall, short grasses. So the different times of year you can hit it, the animals will find the the higher quality forage at a certain time. They'll utilize it then and leave some for later. You know, um, it, it works pretty well. What about um, um, the one thing to bring up with that is the one thing different with bison you can't graze sheep with them. Um, they actually they can be a carrier of this malignant catarrhal fever known as MCF. And that will sheep can be sheep are a carrier for it, and they'll actually kill a bison. Um, goats, goats as a rule are safe. Um, I know people that have goats, but sheep are very are very much a large concern to keep sheep away from your bison. We had a neighbor that got a sheep as a pet, and we ended up having sheep. We had to sit down and talk with her then. Like, you know, this is a problem. We talked about this, was it, uh, what's the fever? MCF, malignant catarrhal fever. MCF, we talked to her about her and she just looked me dead in the eyes. And she says, so you're telling me I have to get rid of my sheep? And I was <laughs> like, yeah, I said, I'll buy you a goat. I'll get you whatever you, a donkey. I don't care, you know, you can't have a sheep. And she looked me dead in the eyes and she said, well, that's my pet. <laughs> and I just said, I don't know what to tell you, man. But we're gonna get along now and find and everything. She ended up getting a, a mini donkey to replace the sheep, so. We're good there. Interesting. Um, what about predation? Do you guys have trouble with, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, wolf or bear or anything out there going after the bison? Are they pretty resistant to predation? Yeah, commonly coyotes are, are the thing that would be in our area. We don't really know wolves here to speak of, bears, none. Um, coyotes are very, very great in volume and are a huge concern to the beef producers and sheep and sheep goes. and but with the bison they're very protective there's no issue there and then let me ask you i mean in the u.s there's roughly about three quarters of a million beef cattle ranchers you know most of them have about 40 50 head what is it how many bison ranches are there in the u.s do you know have an idea how many how many you guys are there an organization you guys are members of is there kind of like a you know, is there, is there some sort of organization for bison ranchers, and how many how many ranches do you think there are? There's a uh, multiple bison, uh, you know, associations. There's the National Bison Association, the NBA. Uh, that's you know, obviously the entire United, you, know, you know, the United States and also Canada. They, there's members that get involved. We don't know the numbers. We have our local association, um, which is Dakota Territory Bison Buffalo Association. Uh, and we really don't know the numbers on that. It's uh, that's really hard to pin down. You know, there would, there's really not an incentive to find out. You know, there's no there's no incentive to find out because you know the big packers stuff don't want to know how many ranches are out there and to tell a story. The beef checkoff doesn't have. You know, we don't have any of that for bison. We have associations which we are active in. Alex is actually a member of uh, the Dakota Territory Bison Association, um, and. It's uh, no, I mean, we that's where a lot of our sales are at, at these association conferences. 
um, like our show and sales and, and things like that. Um, that's where, you know, the bison industry is a family. It is, and that's where everyone gets together and we, you know, have our celebrate celebrations and and uh, go over where the industry's headed. So. And do you find that um, um, you get a lot of a lot of beef producers? asking you guys about converting over to bison is that something you got you guys run into very often a few years ago when the beef market was really trending down you could see people being a little more intrigued you know it's slowly the, the beef people are, are fairly optimistic right now so you see less of that this last year and so much of of the beef is very traditional so that's the thing. People have a pretty hard time leaving tradition. Yeah. So it's it's fairly limited. A lot of people right. ranch just because it's their lifestyle. Um, you know, it's it's deep in them. They raise cattle. Um, and I guess if you don't have to be economical, then that's fine. But if you have land to pay for, you have family to raise stuff, you you know the Sustainability starts with financial sustainability as well as, uh, you know, ecological sustainability. But if you can't make your payments, none of that matters. So that's where that's, you know, a lot of it comes down to that. But if that's what you do, you've been ranching, same ranch, 120 years, you're not even thinking about bison. Why would you? Um, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Let me ask you this final question, uh, probably the most important question, I think, for you guys. Anyways, where do we go to get some Dakota pure bison? What's the, what's the, what's the way people find out about it? Do you guys sell by the by bulk? Do you guys sell by the half, by the quarter? Or do you sell primarily boxed beef? Or what's the, what's the deal for, for the average person listening to this? Where do they go? So you can go to dakotapurebison.com. Um, we have many different box options on there. We're really expanding our different options. You know, I think when we talked to you the first time we had about six or seven or eight different box options. And now I think we have upwards of 70. Um, so obviously the best value is buying either an eighth or a quarter or a half of an animal. But, you know, like it, it's our quarter is called the pioneer package and our eighth is called the stewardship package, but we sell all the way down to where you can get a hot dog and a bra and a breakfast sausage in a box. Um, you get five pounds of burger. We are now selling meat sticks, which has been a big hit. Um, four ounce meat sticks. Um, they are really they're hundred percent bison, which is very rare to have a hundred percent bison meat stick. Most people add pork, beef fat. The rest of ours are hundred percent. We've had awesome reviews on those. Um, we are very active on social media, Instagram and Facebook, um, and also we have a YouTube channel that. Um, we're, we're not active on, but we have a lot of YouTubers come to our places and do videos. So those are all up there. Um, we keep everyone updated on through Instagram and, and yeah, we're just, you know, looking to grow. Um, people find that having that ship direct to your door for free, we're all free shipping, 100% free shipping. Um, they it just gets rid of that burden of worrying about, Hey, my freezer's empty. Where do I go to find some frozen meat or uh, a snack stick that's actually good for you? And you actually know you're not, you know, the snack stick industry is very bizarre, you know, to me, because it's just, it's just, mar it's just like beef. It's just marketing agencies that can go and buy product and buy trim and slap a fancy label on it and sell it to you. With, with, they try to come up with a story, but um, they're actually not getting anything. You're, you're, you know, it's somebody who six years ago was selling, you know, T-shirts and now they see bison is trending on the, you know, on social media. So they switch to selling bison where, you know, this is what we do every day. This is what our families do. Um, uh, this, this is what we do. We, we raise bison. Um, so uh, it, it's in our customers. We just can't thank them enough. We have awesome customers. They're just fully in the game. Um, I think we have some crossover between uh, uh, some of your followers and ours. So we appreciate that, Doc, you know, a lot uh, for your, you know, taking interest in our project, I guess. So we uh, really thank you for that. 
Yeah, and, you know, and I in, in the field, like I said, I, I always, whenever I get somebody's feeding me, you know, I mean, either, either individually, collectively, somebody's feeding us. I don't think you guys get thanked enough, and so I just want to extend it. And I sure I speak for the entire community. Thank you guys for doing what you do because it ain't easy. I mean, it's, you know, I, I just think about God. You know, it's like you know, it's cold up there, and it's cold in the wintertime. Those animals don't care; they're not taking the day off, so you don't get to either. And and you know, I, I really appreciate what you guys do. So keep up the good work, and I wish you the best. Anything I can do or we can do as a community to support you guys, uh, you know, I'm sure we're, we're all gonna we're all gonna do that because you know you. You keep putting out a good product and, uh, you know, it, it, it sells itself for the most part, except, you know, you got people trying to tell us that, you know, fake meat is going to be. Yeah, you keep, hold, you keep hold the line on that side of things, Doc. I, uh, I really enjoy what you, you put out there. And uh, we've been, the uh, last few days, I've been brushing up on some of the podcasts you do with, with people. And you're very, uh, it, I am surprised, like, people are surprised when they hear your podcast is how, like, level-headed and open-minded you are to you know pe- people taking you know taking control of their health and then they see you know like the fake meat stuff and you see you that's where you draw the line and that's where i like where you draw the line because that is total garbage it's absolutely garbage so i, I like that you do that and it just because you're so matter of fact about it and you're so level-headed about it people get exposed to that and they realize oh this isn't just some crazy guy that's eating meat or eating raw meat and he's just a savage, you know, he's so level-headed. So I appreciate you doing what you've done over the past four or five years. It's really helped. You know, there should be, the beef checkoff should have you on every commercial, you know, instead of just the, the fakeness they put out there. So yeah, I've, I've, had, I've had some of that feedback that the beef checkoff is not doing enough for the beef industry. And, you know, I mean, honestly, when I look about it, and, you know, there may be some, obviously they're doing some lobbying behind the scenes, but to the public's eye, Where's the campaign saying how good and healthy meat is? I mean, my gosh, I shouldn't have to be, you know, fighting to get funding to do studies on on, on meat-based diets, and I am. And, and it's just kind of crazy because uh, I know the beef checkoff takes in, you know, $30, $50 million a year uh, from the from the checkoff money. And, and it's just kind of like, you know, I shouldn't be have I shouldn't have to do this, but you know, <laughs> I, I care about my kids' future. And I, I like eating, you know, having access to good meat. And I think we all do. And so I guess somebody's got to do it. So anyway, guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, look forward to seeing you guys grow. And anything else we can do, let me know. I'm happy to do that. Um, you guys have a great day. I guess get out, get back there and grow some more, grow some more bison. And uh, <laughs> we'll try to eat them. All right, guys. Thank you so much. The rest of you guys, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Scott, Alex, have a great day. Thank you, Doc. Bye-bye now.